I want to know that I'm grounded here. You don't know this, my mom grew up in Brigham City, uh, and I spent my summers in Brigham City and traveling up to Logan, and how many times I've, uh, my uncle worked at Sherwood Hills, uh, that's where I learned to hit golf balls, and that's why I still am not very good. Um, <laughs> Uh, they got them for free, so. Uh, but going by Manaway Lake and up to Lake Powell, I mean Lake Powell, Bear Lake with my dad, my grandpa, uh, stopping at the Bluebird Cafe, you know, I'm grounded. And when I went to BYU, my side, of the, my mom's side of the family never forgave me. Um, <laughs> to this day, to this day, I will say, well, it worked out great down there. Yeah, but if you would have been at Utah State, it would have been better. <laughs> and that goes for. <laughs> when, I, when I was All-American at BYU, they would say, well, you could have been All-American two years in a row. You know, and I, I would have played in the NFL for 15 years. Well, you would have played for 18 years. You know, I mean, it, all, it never ended. And, um, and so this is an ongoing uh, ag, you know, especially what, when the Aggies beat us a few weeks ago. Trust me, my, my phone lit up, you know, <laughs> from... <laughs> from the Steed family, which is now burgeoning to, you know, 500 people. So this is a painful truth. So to pay it forward, um, I decided that I was going to be proactive in our firm. We found a young man that was, uh, grew up in Logan, uh, went to Utah State, and uh, we thought that was a, uh, and named Steve Young. And we hired him. <laughs> and he's in our firm right now. So there's a Steve Young from Utah State that I work with. So... <laughs> I think that's fair, right? I'm doing my part. I'm trying to do my part. Um, so we're, we're friends. I guess that's my point. Don't run me out of town uh, too fast. Uh, th the honor I have is really uh, rooted in my experience with Steve Covey through the years. But in actuality, my experience that I want to relate with you today is that he changed my life. And he changed it in 60 minutes. But in many ways, that's what Stephen's done for everybody. Right? A chapter in the book, some precept or concept or uh, habit that you're going to try to work on. I mean, it, he changes lives in that interim time. So this story probably will resonate with you. Uh, when I uh, start, started with the 49ers in 1987, for four years, it was Joe Montana versus me. And uh, it was a battle. And it was a battle of uh, epic proportions in San Francisco. In many ways, um, uh, it was David and Goliath. Uh, but... I was David, of course. Joe was Goliath. And I didn't have any rocks. So it, was not, it wasn't very fun. Like, was, I had a sling. And I whooped around really fast, but nothing flew. You know? But we were at, I, you know, I did my best, and I tried to make it as uh, competitive as I possibly could. I hated being the backup. I always hated the thought of if I was going to, I always told people, if I was going to watch, I'd rather go to law school. I'd rather do something else. I don't want to watch. No, no disparity against anyone else that wants to watch, but I don't want to. And I hated those four years. Uh, but I was competitive, and I nipped at his heels wherever I could. I challenged him however I possibly could. And it was constantly in the newspaper. It was constantly a, it, it was pitted as a battle. But we never fought. We never had a harsh word. We were not toxic personalities. And so despite all of the rigor, um, it wasn't personal between us. But it was like a Cold War. And he forced everyone to choose a side. And uh, so I didn't have many friends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who's, okay, you got to pick somebody. Uh, okay, I'll pick you. <laughs> not, not the little guy. So my, my, those four years were fraught with all kinds of dilemmas and anxieties and, and challenges and, uh, that I was working through. And in the interim of those four years, Joe Montana led the team to two Super Bowls and two MVPs. And so I had to watch. The most, my most hated thing in the world, I was forced to watch. Finally, in 1991... Joe got hurt and was going to be out the entire season. So it was my year. It was my time. And I knew that there were going to be comparisons that had already happened. Everywhere I went, it was, you know, well, you know, was Joe or Steve? Or, I knew those comparisons, and I knew that I inherited that part of the, my life. I knew that was going to be a part of my life. But I had no idea how insane it would get when I started to play regularly. Every game was dissected. Because if Joe had played, it would have been different. And throughout 1991, the first six or seven or eight games, we were not great. We had just won the Super Bowl twice. We were supposed to be great. Because we weren't great, why aren't we great? 
well, that's pretty easy. <laughs> Steve's here, right? <laughs> and it was every game, almost every series, every play, every word was compared. It became a thing that it was like, it became so maddening. I noticed over the weeks it started to wear on me. I started to not sleep well. I was struggling with anxiety. Um, week to week when we wouldn't play well, I would take this huge burden on myself. And I started to build resentment for the situation, how unfair it was, how wrong it was, how overinvested I was in the success of the team, and how underinvested everyone else was. Instead of, as they, as they attacked me, I started to attack back. And I felt it. I lived it. It got so bad that in October of 1991, you can go look it up, San Francisco Chronicle. You know, it's probably on microfiche at that point, this point. I don't know. We'll have to see. But, but above the fold in the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, right under the headline of the, you know, of the banner, was a headline. And the Gulf War had just broken out in 1991, where we were at war in the Middle East. And the headline was, the Gulf War, it's Steve Young's fault. <laughs> Super funny, right? <laughs> but for me, a guy that had built up now weeks and now months of continual anxiety and almost depression, when you stop sleeping well and you're really struggling to eat, you're struggling at work, you're, you're battling, you're fighting with everything you get, you give every ounce of yourself every week, to no success, and everybody's knee-jerk, true response of why it's not going well is, Steve's not here. I mean, Joe's not here. It's Steve's fault, and epitomized by this headline. So I'll give you that context, because there was about mid, early November, right around this time of year, I had gotten to a point where I just needed, I needed to get away. I, I saw Christmas out in the future, and I didn't know how I was going to get there. How in the world am I going to live long enough to make it through this season? And so I decided I was going to run to Salt Lake City. My brother was at University of Utah Medical School, and he had a young family, married a young family. I thought, I'll just run. I had a day off. I ran on a Delta flight, jumped in, uh, got there on late Monday night, and spent the night with my brother. And we walked around town, around the U, and, I, you know, and he's struggling through medical school, and he's trying to... And as we walked, I was telling him how horrific my life was and how difficult it was, and how I'm not going to make it. And he, you know, he's like, well, I'm not going to make it. I'm in med school. I can't pay for it. I don't know what to do. And, uh, uh, and so as we walked around, I was trying to find you know, a cathartic or some relief or something that would make me feel a little bit better. And he had, a tr he had trouble giving me anything that was really useful, other than a warm handshake and a, and a hug, really. And that was really true for my whole family. And then I got on the plane the next uh, evening to go back. And you can understand, going back was kind of the last thing I wanted to do. I honestly just, it makes me tear up just thinking about right now how hard it was to get back on that plane. Like, all I wanted to do was run. But I got back on the plane because I knew you can't run. There's nowhere to go. You got to go back. So I get on the plane, and I sit down next to this bald guy. I say that because we've known each other for a long time, but I had never spent much time with Stephen. I'd been around him. I'd seen him at events. I'd, I'd known his kids. I'd known I'd, they were my friends, but I'd, hadn't never, I'd never really had a chance to, to, to spend time with him. And so as I sat down, I didn't notice him. And I, I, you could imagine, I'm, I'm in my own little space, and he nudges me. He says, hey, Steve, Stephen Covey. Oh, hey, how are you? He goes, how, oh, great, how are you? So I, for the first 30 minutes of the flight, just unload, right? Because he asked. And I was at a place in my life where you're going to hear, right? <laughs> and I gave him every inch, inch of it, how difficult it was, how painful it's been, how I can't, there's nothing, I just feel this huge burden that I can't even start to breathe in. I'm not sleeping. I'm... I, I'm pretty sure I'm depressed. I don't know what that really means, but I know that that's, if it is something, I got it. Um, so he listened and listened and listened, and that's one of the first things I noticed. He listened. And that's one of the great qualities of a human being. And he heard every ounce of it. And I finished kind of exhausting myself of everything that I could tell you, tell him. And he said, 
wow, that is a lot. And man, I feel what you're saying. I can feel it. Um, first thing I want to tell you, which is remarkable, the first thing I want to tell you is that how you describe how difficult it is with so many guys on your team is because it's scientifically proven that any more than seven in a group of human beings starts to devolve. And so you add an eighth person, it goes, the efficiency goes down. The ninth person, even more geometrically. Tenth person, you get to 11, you've got way too many people. So you're right. It is too many people. But let me be the first to tell you, the magic in life is when you've taken, by definition, scientifically too many people and figured out a way to win, to be successful, to be abundant. That is the magic. Don't miss that opportunity with too many people. Because there is where, therein lies the magic. I've thought about that a thousand times since then. Because life is by definition too many people. And how can we find that magic with, by, by, by definition, uh, inefficient systems? And so I, lo- I didn't really want to hear that at the time. I was like, oh, okay. I've res- I, that's resonated with me more and more since then. But that wasn't the first thing that I remember about that conversation. But I remember it for, lo- I remember it for the longest time because it's, it's really true. Then he said, you know, Steve, can, you, can I ask you a couple of questions? I said, sure. He goes, you know, I don't, I don't follow football, you know, too much. I know a little bit. My kids play. I mean, I, I, but I don't follow the pro game very much. I know you're with the 49ers. But uh, tell me about the owner of the team. I said, well, that's Eddie DeBartolo. I go, tell me about him. What kind of guy? What, tell me about his, his management style, what he does. And I said, well, he's amazing. He's, uh, he's the first uh, person that I, and I remember, I was gone, I just a little quickly context. In 1987, all the players in the NFL struck, like picket line. I had a picket sign up in front of the 49ers. We were picketing for rights and free agency and different things. And he said, this is the, and so for context, I had already known what the owners thought about the players. The owners thought of us as chattel. We were, we were just cattle to, to trade back and forth. Eddie was the first owner that treated us like partners, like family. Asked us questions about how we were doing. How can I help? What do you need? He's an amazing guy. I couldn't think of a better person to be around from an owner and player perspective. In fact, he's the first person to actually fill the canyon in between, between the two sides. And I'm really grateful to him. And Stephen says, yeah, I've heard that about him. That really sounds like, you know, I'd really like to meet him sometime. Sounds like an interesting guy to get to know. He said, let me ask you another question. Your coach, Bill Walsh, I, I, I know about him, but I don't, you know, just what, do you, what, do you, what can you tell me? I said, oh, my gosh. I mean, football is archaic. Football before Bill Walsh was let's get him out in the heat and make him have no water to make him tougher and better shape. Let's not worry about how they're fed or how they're sleeping or their mental health. Let's not think about anything other than just with a big stick in a zero-sum game. You're going to do it my way or no way. And I just beat you with this big stick, and that's how we're going to coach football. And that's how we're going to play football, and that's how we're going to teach football. Before Bill Walsh, that's what it was. Today, it still is little remnants of it, but most of it's been influenced by what Bill did. And in the middle of me being with him, I'd already known it. I wish we had more time, I'd tell you about him too. But in telling Stephen about Bill Walsh, that he's, he's forward thinking in everything that he does. Play calling, offense, how he treats us, how we, how we, you know, how we travel, all the things that you worry about to make sure someone, someone's healthy. He said, you know, I'd heard that. I, 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 that's what I wondered. I, I, I'd heard that and that makes me feel like I really would like to meet him too sometime. I look forward to that. Now, one last question, Steve. Uh, Joe Montana. Is he on the team? And I said, Stephen, that's the problem. Yes, he's on the team. He's hurt and not playing, but that's, that's probably most of my problem. He said, but let me ask you, if you needed to go to him as a mentor, 
I know he's one of the great players of all time. If you needed to go to him as a mentor to ask him a question, advice, could you do it? Yeah, sure. I think he'd answer the question. I think he'd give me the advice. No question about that. Hmm. I thought that might be the case. Um, Steve, I don't know if you know what I do, but I travel the world looking for what I'll call platforms that corporations, business, families, organizations, anybody that has built a platform where the human beings that are associated with that platform are given the opportunity to iterate to find out how good they can get. Because that's what every human being wants to do. They want to find out their full potential. And I look for those systems, platforms, and I seek them. I go travel around. I, I, want to, I hear about them. I want to go meet them. I want to get what, what I can of them because then I want to amplify those things that make them great, that allow other humans to see how good they can get. And that's what I do. And I got to be honest with you, hearing your story and you answering my questions, if I had to say the platform that you have with the 49ers, with the owner and the coach and the mentorship and the opportunity and the nature of their team, I got, I got to be honest with you, Steve. I don't know that I have ever seen a better one. Uh, I, 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 was, I was dumbfounded. I, I didn't... I wanted someone to tell me how horrific it was and how right I was and how I should be... I'm victimized and that this isn't fair and because that, that's human nature. And here was somebody very honestly but really effectively coming back and communicating back that... I might be the luckiest guy alive. That's what he's saying. I travel the world, and I don't know that I've ever seen anything better. For opportunity to have a platform to iterate to see how good you can get. And then, like Yoda, literally with a finger out. <laughs> and I, I mean, literally made me sure that he got me in his eyes. You know, and with his finger out, he said, and asked one last question, do you want to see how good you can get? Because not everybody does. It's a risk. There's a risk. But do you, and I want you to think about it, do you want to see how good you can get? I, I, I processed it, thought about it for a second, and then there was this like, spot in me. This like, I don't know, that's how I got there. You know, this part that's like, yes! Absolutely that's what I want. I want that risk. That risk is not too much for me. That's what I want to do. That's what I, that's absolutely what I want to do. And then he said, it was unbelievable, he's just like, then go do it. Just classic, right? My whole world just went like upside down. And what's amazing about it is he tapped into a part of me that could see that he was telling the truth. It wasn't an inspirational story so you could go just change your emotion. It wasn't, in, you know, like uh, uh, something to just get your uh, motivated. No, it was truth telling. It was foundational to the situation that I was in and he formed in a way that lasted. I raced down to work the next day because Wednesday morning is if you're going in the NFL, if you're going to get fired, it happens Wednesday morning before they open up the playbooks for the next week for the game. That's when the coach calls you in and says, hey, you know what, Steve? Uh, your depression and the way you've acted and your kind of the way you've been moping around here and you know I know it's a lot to handle but that's when they call you in and kind of tell you we're going to go with somebody else and I remember racing down that morning with this incredible fundamental change in how I looked at the world and how I looked at my experience and my own life 
so excited and praying that I don't get fired, knowing that I did a lot, self-inflicted, that they would have been probably right to, to fire me. Not because of how I played, but just how I acted. The victimization that I was living with and all the, it was self-inflicted so much of it. They didn't fire me that morning and I survived that season. From that moment on, I repeated to myself 10,000 times, do you want to see how good you can get? And repeated back to myself 10,000 times, yes, I do. So no matter what happened, being the bread line, I mean, being at the grocery store in line trying to check out, and the person in front of me talking to the red cash, you know, the, the clerk, as they're getting rid of their groceries, I just overhear him. Well, what do you think of Steve? Well, he sucks. <laughs> He's horrible. He's no joke. I mean, I, just constantly. But all of a sudden, hearing that in the bread in the line with my bread, it didn't matter. It didn't hit me that way anymore. Because I had this vision that I was about to find out how good I can be. It didn't matter anymore if I was Joe Montana. It just didn't. It, it changed. And I give you this last little fact only to let you know the, the incredible difference it had made in my life. That next season, 1992, I won the NFL MVP award. Now, look, you have to do it with a lot of people, and it doesn't, that doesn't happen overnight. I'm not, that's not alone. But from a depressed, anxiety-ridden pit that I had dug and lived in, I was given the perspective and the foundational elements of what is true. He didn't, he didn't motivate me with some other example. He motivated me what was true in my life, what was standing right in front of me. I remember we played the Dallas Cowboys that year. They were the new, the new great team, and Troy Aikman was the quarterback. And at Candlestick Park, we, pra we warmed up with, with the offenses at the 50-yard line, and we'd go opposite ways to warm up. And so you'd see the other quarterbacks from the other team right there every week. And I saw Troy Aikman, and I instinctively ran up to him. I knew him a little bit. Troy! Thanks for coming. I'm on this quest to find out how good I can get, and I can only find out against the best. And you guys are the best, so I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> and Troy looked back at me. Oh, okay. Great. The story for me is one that I think embodies Stephen Covey because he was rooted in a truth about human beings, about how humans relate and how we could be better. And he had a quest. I think he was on a quest too. How good can I be to provide tools for other humans to find out how good they can be? It's magic. It's incredible. In today's society, in today's political environment, we are so fraught with zero-sum game thinking, limited resources, and we're fighting. And that relationship is adversarial, divisive, and I'm, we're, someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. And that's how we look at it. And so we're battling, and whatever I get, I get. And whatever you get, you get. And there is no healing there is no abundance. None. It's not possible. It's zero-sum game. It's how it's looked at foundationally. We need Stephen Covey. We need abundance in relationships. We need the ability, no matter how adversarial the relationship, that fact that it's a relationship needs to find the human values that allow for abundance so that we can see each other, find the common ground, figure out how literally it's win-win. It's the only way because if you win in a zero-sum game, you know what happens to the guy who loses? He spends the rest of his life coming back to revenge because I got beat and now I'm going to come get you. So nothing ever actually gets won. 
It's always contested. And it continues to be contested into the future. There is no winning. The only way to win is in a spirit of abundance. Because both sides say, you know what? That works. It's hard. It's difficult. But it works. And then I don't have to spend the rest of my life trying to battle back and beat you back. And that's what Stephen spent his life doing. He spent an hour with me. And literally changed the trajectory of my life. If I would have stayed in that hole, there was no other way to get out of that hole for me. No other way. I would have sat in there, and I might have beaten my way out of it and tried to claw it and try to figure it out because that was my nature. But I would have not had an abundance. I would have survived, maybe, gotten to Christmas. But there's no way that we were going to feed a success story, one that could really find its momentum. It's truth. How good can you get? How many times have I said that to other human beings since then? How much do I beg my own kids to seek this quest to find out how good you can get? Being good matters. Fundamentally. So I, you can tell when they called me to, to speak, I'm like, I got to figure it out. I had 10 other things I had. Today was not an undone day. I mean, there was like, I was be four different places. And I was like, I got to figure it out. Because the impact is so dramatic. And if I could do anything tonight, today, is to give you a sense that every relationship that you have, whether it's intimate at home, with your kids, with your extended families, with your dear friends, or it's as, as extended as the person that you run into at the red light next to you in traffic. It's a relationship. And in that relationship, can you find the healing and the abundance in it? Can you spend the next weeks, days, hours, minutes, breaths, looking in the relationships that you have, the millions that happen every day, not millions, but thousands, and especially the most intimate ones that you own? Can I find abundance inside of that? Can I be the healing agent that allows for that other person on the other side of the relationship to see how good they can get? Can I free them up to go do that? That is the legacy of Stephen Covey. It was the legacy that he had affected my life. So I, I pay it forward today with as much passion as I possibly can because of the effect it had on my life, that each one of you will be the healing agents to find that abundance in every relationship. And if we do that and we can spread that, you can change the world. Stephen truly believed. I knew it from the very, I knew it from just knowing him. He believed he could change the world. He knew it and spent his life doing it. So let's keep it going. Thank you very much.